Good morning. My name is Jasmine Witherspoon, and I'm an MFA candidate in English at the University of Kentucky. On behalf of the university, welcome to the main stage. It's my pleasure to introduce Associate State Director of Advocacy and Outreach for AARP Kentucky, Mr. Daniel Rowe, who will introduce our next event. Hey, good morning, folks. Glad to have you here at the Kentucky Book Festival, and AARP Kentucky is proud to be a sponsor of our book festival today. We've got a great lineup of authors here for you, and I want to tell you a little bit about AARP. One is that we have 32,000 members in, a in AARP Fayette County, Lexington alone, 32,000. So y'all make up a membership of that. We also have 420,000 statewide, Kentucky strong, and 38 million nationwide. So we're proud of, proud of our members, proud of our members and what, and what you all do in our communities. Um, and just a reminder, AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan, nonpartisan membership organization, and we love being out in the community and doing events like this, doing advocacy, um, and making things happen in our community. Um, so with that, I do want to introduce, before we get to our authors, a special guest, um, Dr. Mary Lynn Moran-Smith who is a volunteer with our executive council, so I'll hand it over to her. Thank you. Good morning. I am Mary Lynn Moran Smith. I represent the sixth district on the executive council, the state board for AARP. That includes 17 counties. We are excited and happy to be a co-sponsor for this event and are happy that you are here. When Joanne Jenkins took over as CEO for AARP, she outlined a mission to change the conversation in this country about what it means to grow older. She said, I believe getting older is not about aging, it's about living. This is a part of what we talk about, living. Specifically, to embrace aging as something to look forward to and something not to fear. To see aging as a period of growth, not declined. Third, to recognize the opportunities of aging, not just the challenges. And last but not least, perhaps most importantly, she said we should not fear aging and be a part of living and contributing to society. That is what the Lexington AART volunteer team does every single day. We live, we fight, we join, we sing, we contribute. We do a lot of things in the community in Fayette County. Also, starting in 2023, we will be reaching out to the other counties in the sixth district. Our goal is to say we're here and we belong. Enjoy yourselves, and I turn it back over to Jay. Thank you, Mary Lynn. It's, it's wonderful volunteers like Mary Lynn, Jim, several others that we have here today that make a difference uh, for AARP. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our authors. Um, so we've got Stephen Perrine. He's the executive director for AARP The Magazine and the AARP Bulletin. He oversees health and wellness coverage, reaching more than 38 billion readers. And he, he's the former editor-in-chief of Best Life and editorial creative director of Men's Health. He has appeared as a nutrition expert on Today, Good Morning America, and The 700 Club. Also joining Stephen is nutritionist and exercise physiologist Heidi Skolnick, who has appeared on The Today Show, live with Kelly Ripa, and The Food Network. She oversees performance nutrition at the School of American Ballet and the Juilliard School. Please give a warm welcome to Stephen Perrine and Heidi Skolnick. Thank you, Daniel, very much. Thank you to AARP and for the folks at Joe Beth for having us here. Really appreciate the opportunity. And I have to say, I am inspired. I am really inspired. So first, let's start off with just a question. How many of you, show of hands, have heard that your metabolism slows down as you age, and that's one reason why you gain weight? So we are going to help dispel some myths in the next 45 minutes to better help you understand what actually is going on with your body and what you can do as you age to stay strong and lean and healthy. 
Yeah. Now, uh, as the health director for AARP magazine and bulletin, I get my inbox is always flooded with notes from members and questions. And the most common question that I'm asked is, why am I gaining weight as I get older? I eat the same, I exercise the same, but I'm still gaining weight. What's going on? Well, the fact is that as we get older, our bodies change. And because of that, the way that we eat needs to change because that is how we're going to prevent age-related weight gain and age-related muscle loss. So as it relates to metabolism, a great study came out in 2021 in the journal Science, and it was with over 6,000 people. And what it showed was, in fact, our metabolism does not change between age 20 and age 60. After age 60, it begins to slow down a little less than 1% per year. So yes, by the time you're 85, your metabolism does slow down, but if you've gained weight between ages 20 and 60, it is not because of your metabolism. Right, so there's something else, something else is happening. What is that? The first thing I want you to do is everybody here, make a muscle. Show me, show me a bi show me the gun show, bring it out. There we go. Okay. That bicep right there, that represents about 5% of all of the lean muscle in your body. That's how much we lose every decade after age 30. Losing 5% of our skeletal muscle every decade. And that leads to a lot of health-related issues. That's one of the reasons why we gain weight, because muscle is critical for storing glucose, which is sugar from the blood. It was, muscle stores it in the form of glycogen. So if you don't have muscle, that blood sugar continues to circulate, and that can lead to weight gain. Muscle also burns more calories than fat does. So as we lose muscle, we naturally begin to burn fewer calories. And third, of course, muscle keeps us strong and mobile, which is critical, again, for keeping our weight down and keeping ourselves lean and healthy. So one of the things that happens as we lose muscle, as it relates to metabolism, as I said, our metabolism is working, but we have less active tissue. So we do lower our metabolism because we have less muscle, not because we're not able to metabolize. The tissues that we have can metabolize. But one thing that does change with age is what's called anabolic resistance. And that sounds a little intimidating, but all it really means is when you're young and you drink a glass of milk, that eight grams of protein goes into muscle, right? You're growing and you're in a building phase and you don't have to do much. Do you remember, do you remember those days, right? When you didn't have to do much and you were just, you were just muscle. As we age, we become resistant to building muscle. So when you drink that glass of milk or have eight grams of protein, your muscle goes, eh, you need to do more. And we actually need more protein to build that muscle build, to press that muscle building button. We need 25 to 30 grams of protein at a time to stimulate our muscle to overcome that resistance and allow us to maintain the muscle we have. That's her meal. So. And that starts with breakfast. And of course, holding on retaining muscle leads to a lot of other benefits. And we have a first slide here that just gives a list of some of the benefits of the whole body reset and the benefits of holding on to muscle as we get older. I mean, we're talking about not just weight gain, but we're talking about preventing and reversing age-related illness and weight gain, supporting and regulating the immune system. We all know what happened during COVID and how having you know, people who were overweight, people who had high inflammation were at greater risk. We're talking about holding on to muscle as it relates to being stronger, preventing frailty, making sure that we can enjoy the things that we want to enjoy in our lives protecting against the loss of mobility, bolstering cognitive function. Studies show that people who hold on to the most muscle as they age also have higher levels of cognitive function. One of the reasons, of course, is 
inflammation because muscle fights inflammation. Promotes bone health. Bone and muscle works together to keep you strong and healthy. So as you lose muscle, you begin to lose bone as well. Cardiovascular health, uh, again, people who have the most muscles have the lower, lower risk of heart disease and heart-related issues. Stabilizes blood sugar, what I talked about a little bit. Improves general digestive health. And alertness, engagement, and vitality. So these are some of the benefits that we're talking about when we're talking about making some simple, simple changes to your diet and making sure that you're not losing muscle as you get older. Right, so sarcopenia, I'm sure you've all heard that term. That's that loss of muscle that also can accelerate as we age and that cycle of sort of inflammation that can go on that the more muscle we have, the muscle can act sort of as an anti-inflammatory agent. The more fat we have, the more inflammatory we ha are, and we lose more muscle. And again, maintaining that muscle is so important because that muscle pulls on bone, which helps keep our, our bones strong. Mobility reduces the risk of falls. We know that more muscle is actually related to reduced risk of Alzheimer's and heart disease. So the list goes on and on in terms of the relation of maintaining muscle. And that's really the focus. It's not really just about weight loss. It's more fat loss and, and maintaining muscle that's so very important. So we go back to the first question we asked that I heard from people is, I'm eating the same and I'm exercising the same as I did when I was in my 20s and 30s, but I keep gaining weight, what's going on? We slide, pull up the next slide. What's going on is that our bodies, as we become resistant to protein, are not able to build and maintain muscle. And one of the reasons is the way that we typically eat in the American diet. So the average American gets about 10 grams of protein for breakfast. So you wake up, you have a coffee, you have maybe a donut, maybe you have some avocado toast if you're a millennial. Or maybe you have like an egg or two, but, or even some oatmeal, right? But the fact is none of those meals are adding up to enough protein. 25 grams of protein if you're a woman, 30 grams of protein if you're a man to start your day. So what happens is we will start off our day, our bodies are protein starved, we don't give them enough to get that make muscle button going. So all day long, our bodies are building down and uh, breaking, uh, breaking down. down and building back up muscle. But if we don't have enough protein in the morning, it's going to be a muscle loss day. Now, I think it's important to add... Oh. We're going to show you. Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> I wonder if we have some slides for that. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about how, yeah, we'll get into that. But as you saw in the previous slide, though, what's happening is that we're eating the majority of our protein at dinner time. We're eating, we're eating 90 grams of protein a day, but 60 of it is coming at dinner because we're having the burger, we're having the steak. We're having a bigger meal with vegetables and rice and all of these things contain protein, but guess what? Our bodies can pr process at most, maybe, 40 grams of protein. So when we eat that big dinner with all that protein, it's all going to waste. Well, it's being used in a different way. It's but not it's being not being, used. it's not it's going not to make building and maintain muscle. It goes towards your energy, but it's not going toward growth, repair, right. and muscle. So what we're looking to do is to shift that protein to something that looks more like this. Higher protein in breakfast, same lunch, a little bit more, and then at dinner, a more modest dinner. So we're, we're, we're feeding our bodies with that, we're hitting that make muscle button every, you know, three times a day. So we're preventing that age-related uh, weight gain and muscle loss. And let's go to the next and wait, slide. Let me just say what I think is important to recognize here is this isn't a high protein diet. It's an adequate protein diet, but it's based on the principle of protein timing. It's when you eat that protein, distributing it more evenly throughout the day. The protein in this is a little higher than what the recommended dietary allowances now recommend because they were developed, guess what, for younger people. 
and to maintain what's called nitrogen balance, but it doesn't look at timing and it doesn't look at the need to maintain health and muscle as we age. So remember that because we'll talk more about different dietary patterns out there and how this can fit in, but distinguishing it from a high protein diet. So if you had a, had a bowl of uh, oatmeal for breakfast, even with like some blueberries on top of it, and you told your cardiologist, well, he'd give you a gold star. You'd be like, oh, that's a really healthy breakfast. That's great. But actually, the truth is, as we get older, that's not a healthy breakfast because we're not getting the protein that our bodies need. So here we've shown how you could, if, if oatmeal is your thing, try cooking it in milk instead of water, adding in some protein sources like peanut butter, hemp seeds, which is a sneaky, sneaky, delicious way to get an extra protein, next slide. Um, or another one you could do is, like, again, if you're fried eggs and toast, a fried egg only has about six grams of protein in it, so you're still not getting where you need to be. You need to boost that up with maybe some whole grain toast, three, three egg omelet, some avocado, and that's gonna help move you up closer to 25 to 30 grams. Yogurt, again, yogurt's delicious, but you know what? One of those containers of yogurt typically only has maybe 10, 12, 14 grams of protein in it. It's really not big enough for breakfast. So a larger serving or, or uh, taking that yogurt and, and giving it a little boost with some whole grain toast, peanut butter, or other protein source, again, is another way to make sure that you're hitting those numbers in the morning. Now I think I can see some of you like shaking your head like yum. Some of you are probably thinking, wow, I can't eat that much. But remember, we live in this diet culture, right, which has been telling us to eat less and less. And that actually, eating this way, you will find, and, and another, a study actually, I didn't even share this with you that I just read two days ago, was looking at calorically equivalent for breakfast eaters versus breakfast skippers. And there's a lot of different research out there that says when you eat breakfast, you get more nutrition in, and maybe that's a better way in terms of weight loss. Well, if you kept your calories exactly equal, and we'll, we'll come back to this even more yeah. later, you would, um, but, you know, you could lose weight. But the other thing it does is it helps, it helps to maintain your muscle and also your appetite. Because what happens, and I'm sure many of you have experienced this, but you may not have made that connection, when you eat that little bit of yogurt in the morning, how quickly do you get hungry again, right? And you may be scared to think, oh, if I eat this, I'm gonna gain weight, and I'm gonna ask you to experiment and to see how it feels, to see how satiating it is, and how good it feels to actually feed yourself the nourishment in which you need and the calories of which you need, and how that alone will make a difference in maintaining your muscle, but also allowing you to, to, to better regulate your appetite as the day goes on. Right. So, you know, we've been told that we want to restrict calories, we want to lose weight, right? It's exactly what not to do if you're worried about long-term health, fitness, wellness, weight management, and you want to prevent muscle loss because as we restrict calories, we're restricting nutrients. The fact is our body needs more nutrition as we get older, not less nutrition. So there are all sorts of diet plans out there like, um, there's keto, where you don't eat any carbs or protein. Or there's like uh, intermittent fasting, where you skip breakfast, or you only eat on Thursdays, or you, I don't know, you can only eat like between like seven and 11 or what have you. Uh, all of these plans are, 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 may or may not be fine for people in the general population, but as we get older, they become more and more difficult, more and more restrictive, and more and more damaging to our long-term health and wellness. So to that point, again, a different study specifically on intermittent fasting. Now, intermittent fasting can take on lots of different forms. There's ones where you don't eat for a day, and then you eat another day, or you eat in this small window of five hours. So there's lots of different ones. But in this one, when they looked at time-restricted eating, where, where individuals were not eating breakfast, again, for the same number of calories controlled, both groups lost weight. And if weight was your only goal, okay. But when you lose weight, you do lose muscle. About 30% pretty typically on any diet. On the time-restricted one, people were losing 60% of their muscle versus the 
control study where they lost about 30%. That muscle is hard to come by, especially as we age, when we have different injuries, where there may be a hospital stay, we rapidly lose muscle. And it's very hard to rebuild. So it's important that our dietary patterns we don't engage in things like intermittent fasting where you're, you know, when you, if you stop eating after dinner and then you sleep, that's intermittent fasting, right? Like that just was your fasted time. So following, making sure that you get that breakfast, that muscle building part of your day in is really important. So that's that dietary pattern. However, there's a lot of other dietary patterns that this fits with. So whether you're vegan or vegetarian, or even something like Mediterranean diet, which of course we support, really well studied, but it doesn't give recommendations for as we age. It's not specific to nutrient timing or protein timing, where it's really saying how much protein you need at this time. So you could follow something like a Mediterranean style eating plan, as long as you're hitting that 25 to 30 grams of protein at each of your meals and some at snacks. All right, so one of the things that we wanted to do is to create a book that was an eating plan for real people living in the real world, eating real food, which is incredibly unique, actually. Um, and so what was important to me was also to say, well, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a family, and I have a 14-year-old, and she gets hangry. And sometimes I'm driving down the highway, and she's got to be fed right now or she's just going to blast Lana Del Rey until it drives me crazy. So sometimes the only thing you can find is a Wendy's or a McDonald's or a Burger King. Or maybe you find a sit-down place like Chili's or Olive Garden or what have you. Well, I need to be able to eat this plan at any of those restaurants. So we went and we researched the menus at the 50 most popular restaurants in America and give, we actually came up with meal plans that you could eat at any of them. So whether it's Cracker Barrel or Chili's or Starbucks even, we've got a list of foods you can eat that will allow you to basically have this follow this entire thing eating only at restaurants. And I think it's really important, I just want to re-emphasize that, that you know, when you're evaluating if something really works, you want to see, is it affordable? Is it allow flexibility for my food preferences? Right? Does it fit my lifestyle? And there's no food you can't eat. Right? It allows for great choices within what you prefer and what you want and where you want to eat. And I think that's really important because I know with the groups that I work with, often they're trying these diets that make no sense for what they can afford, what's accessible to them, what their food preferences are. They could be socially isolating, like with families, again, if you're like, I can only eat at this time and everyone's going out at a different time. And food, should, food is pleasurable and it's enjoyable and it's nourishing and it's functional and it's celebratory and it's all of those things. And of course, we still want to be able to be healthy and, and enjoy food. So, of course, the book also has tons of recipes in it. Um, but the other thing that we wanted to do is to look at uh, restaurant, uh, uh, supermarket foods, right? So, if you look at a typical supermarket food, a packaged food, it's pretty confusing. There's a lot of words. And those words are like light, natural. What does that mean? Artisanal. What does it mean? A lot of times it doesn't mean anything because a lot of these terms are not regulated by the FDA. So people can put certain terms on their packaging that looks really great, but it's not in fact meaningful. So we decided to break, to come up with a really cool device we call the supermarket decoder. And it's just a simple formula. You can go and pick up any packaged food, and you do a little simple turn. Forget what's on the front. Could be a nice picture of a guy wearing a Quaker outfit, or a fisherman, or a teddy bear. It doesn't matter. Flip, the, flip it over and look at the nutritional guidelines. And you're going to see three important numbers. You're going to see fiber grams, protein grams, and sugar grams. 
And anytime you're looking at a packaged food, do a little bit of math. Take the protein grams and the fiber grams, add them together. If that number is higher than the sugar grams in the food, it's probably a healthy meal, healthy food. If the sugar grams are still higher than the protein and the fiber combined, keep looking. Because there's probably another version of that food that's on that shelf that's going to be healthier for you. So let's talk about fiber, because we haven't really talked about it. As we get older, there are a few things we need more of. Um, fiber is really important for so many reasons. Again, a little bit appetite control, cholesterol lowering, we've heard them. But one, I'm sure you've all heard about the microbiome, our gut health. And fiber really is important for our gut health. And why that's important as we age is because having adequate fiber, and you know, we begin to absorb nutrients not as well as we age, and keeping our gut health, which we are learning is connected to our brain, connected to our muscle, connected to lots of different disease states, and connected to our immune system and our ability to absorb. And fiber is really important for that. So we do encourage adequate fiber, at least five grams per meal, some at snacks or more. The other nutrients that we care about is calcium. And again, it may be that you and I take, eat the same food, but we don't absorb the same amount of calcium from it as we age. And so we want to keep our gut healthy to um, allow us to absorb nutrients. We also, B12 is a nutrient, we, we lose what's called the intrinsic factor, we don't absorb it as well. That's only found in animal foods, so especially if you're vegan, you absolutely have to be um, supplementing with B12. You can find it in one a day. It doesn't have to be mega dosing or anything like that, but many of us don't get enough B12 as we get older. And then healthy fats, which we're not going to go into, but that too has been found for immune function, for lots of anti-inflammation. -infl and they're now looking at its role in keeping our muscle. We don't think of its fat as helping our muscle, but there seems to be something in healthy fats that help the mitochondrial in our muscle, which is our muscle's ability to really continue to um, produce energy, right? And be able to really function at a healthy level. And so healthy fats are part of that. Yeah, and then, I, okay. ahead, no. Lucy? And then I want to say one well, more thing. Well, I was just going to say that an overall healthy diet is really important. We're not like advocating any kind of like Cut anything out. Yeah, weird supplements or cutting out anything. In fact, a recent study it's found that people food. who eat the most fruits and vegetables retain the most muscle as they get older. So it's not just about eating protein. It's also about eating a really balanced uh, array of foods with a lot of produce. And I think that probably comes back to it's, the inflammation issue. It's also more variety. It's interesting because it's not just actually more volume. It's like, again, getting that adequate, even that five a day, three, three vegetables, two fruits a day, which is pretty doable if you're paying attention. But having more variety is, is really crucial to helping because that's, again, what our gut is feeding on. And that really helps keep a diversity going within our Right. And, and in fact, interestingly, one study found that people who eat 30 different plants a week have the healthiest gut microbiomes. Does that sound like a lot? 30 Everyone's plants, gone. 30 different I saw plants? I the eye roll, right? Okay, so at breakfast, I uh -huh. had five, right? This you morning. had five. You had... Two pineapple and... Yeah. and yeah, some and walnuts then, up in there. Walnuts and almonds and oatmeal, oatmeal with that's... my eggs and my and feta cheese. Yeah. So anyway, so you, it's just like not having the same thing. It's really not as hard as it seems. Okay, I want to say two more things. I want to really make sure we get in. One is leucine. We are a very dairy positive book. Um, I know there's lots of trends with different politics around that, but dairy is a really again accessible, affordable, nutrient rich has protein and has in that protein is what's called leucine and I know it's hard to get down a micro level but that leucine is an amino acid that is the is the spark plug to building muscle so including dairy and other again um, you could do a mix of animal and plant-based sources of protein is really helpful as we get older to make sure we're getting an adequate amount of that and then the last thing before we open up to questions being the exercise physiologist that I am, I need to stress how important it is to get moving, but it's not just moving. I know I grew up 
and I grew up in the you know running era where if you had a pair of sneakers and you, you could just pound the pavement, it was more and more get on that elliptical and you know put in time. It's not just about cardio. What's really important to maintain our muscle is resistance or strength training. Now we're not talking about bodybuilding, you know, we're not talking about getting ripped. We're talking about engaging twice a week because actually as we get older we need a little more time to recover. So twice a week in some strength training exercises. And I am going to do a little visual as long as we have it. The Sweet. most Oh, we're going to get a workout here. Them. No, it's not. That's the point. Sorry about that. One of the most important things is just being able to do a squat, right? That keeps our independence. If I can't get up from a chair or a toilet, right, on my own, we're thinking ahead. I always say this, my, you know, I think about myself 10 years from now, right? And what I do now predicts my vitality 10 years from now. So when I don't wanna get moving because today I'm not motivated, I think of my future self and I get moving for my future self. So strain training, it's not just about cardio. In fact, even for our bone health, just doing a little bit is more, doing less more often is more important than doing more less, right? So consider it. It can be bands, it can be weights, free weights, it can be um, yoga and Pilates, but you sure. know, you know. Um, anyway, there's lots of, you can go to your, you know, it could be strength training equipment. It could be but, kung fu fighting. So figure out what works for you, but figure out what works for you because it's so important. So combining protein timing with resistance training is really, really can make the hugest difference and impact for now and for your future self. Now, that was like questions? a tsunami of questions. information, so... Um, let's open up for questions. Yeah. Let's open up for questions, if, yeah. Uh, yeah. Steve and Heidi, if you don't mind, uh, we'd love folks to ask a question yeah. if you have one. Bring I'm, on. gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and run the mic around so everybody can hear, so you don't have to repeat the question. So if you'll raise your hand, I'll come your way. And do we answer your questions about some breakfast? And it could be, by the way, tofu okay. scramble. Like if Are you don't they ready want, for right? me? Like there's Lots Hi. Of Hi. So my question is, um, eating the protein plan that you've showed with the 30-30-30, how, how would that help with anti-inflammatory issues in a body like rheumatoid arthritis? Sure. Does protein help with inflammation in a person's body? Yes, exactly right. So imagine that inside your body there's a war going on, right? On one side there's muscle. Right? Muscles pulling this way. On the other side, it's fat. Fat is muscle's enemy. They hate each other. So the more you work with muscle, the more you build and maintain muscle, the more you diminish fat. But also, fat does something else. Fat causes inflammation. Fat is an inflammatory, uh, you know, Not organ. Dietary fat, yeah. body fat. Body fat. So, but, so yeah. as you build muscle and retain muscle, you're fighting fat, and that is how it's, that's one way that muscle is helping to fight it, inflammation. So it's not the protein, just to be clear though, it's not the protein, the 30 grams you're eating, that is anti-inflammatory. It's the result of building more muscle. And you also want to have those fruits and vegetables and healthy fats to help fight inflammation. There's a lot of different pathways in our body and different cascades that are addressing similar things. And so when we talk anti-inflammation, Again, that could mean different things for different reasons. So again, the protein itself isn't per se anti-inflammatory, but the fruits and vegetables that we recommend would be, and the maintaining muscle would be, very much help. And the movement, there isn't any, there isn't any disease state out there where movement isn't gonna help. It might have to be modified, but there's a way to modify it. Hello. Quick question. Thank you all for coming in. Exciting to have you all in town. For type two diabetes, type two diabetics, yeah. I struggle trying to figure it out and get the budget right. Is there one, two really important things I should be looking at at that label as I'm looking at the nutrition facts? Because sugar's added, two grams, 12 grams, 20 grams. You know, I, 
I get lost in trying to figure out what I should be eating, what I shouldn't be eating. Well, in general, you know, the FDA just a couple of years ago passed a new uh, law that's taken into effect where labels now have sugars, total sugars, and added sugars. And added sugars is the number that you should be really aware of because something really healthy like milk or yogurt has sugar in it. It's natural. But that's different than if somebody comes in and pours a bunch of syrup into it. So one kind of yogurt may have, might have a, you know, four grams of, of, of sugar, and that's the natural lactose that's in, that's in the yogurt. Middle, yeah. Whereas another might have 12 or 15 grams because they put a bunch of syrupy fruit in there, and that's really cane sugar or, or molasses. So that's, that's really important, but, but really honestly, it's that protein plus fiber versus sugar. That's the formula to look at because if you're getting protein, you're getting fiber, it's offsetting any of the sugar that's in the food. But also, again, it's never one, it's never one food, it's how you're putting it together in a meal, right? And so the protein timing helps with blood sugar management. Um, and also, usually when you're adding protein, you also do eat a little bit less maybe of some of the other more carbohydrate rich, we're not against, you need carbohydrate, but your timing of carbohydrate, when, you're, when you have diabetes, more regular, smaller but more regular, with a little break in between, is helpful versus, again, more at once. So adding protein helps to regulate your blood sugar. Having those fruits and vegetables and fiber is really helpful because it, it slows down the release of how it goes into your system. And exercise and muscle, because again, muscle helps clear that blood glucose and it helps you become more insulin sensitive versus insensitive. When you're type two diabetes, you become insulin resistant, right? Your body's sort of saying like, you, like it's, you're knocking on the door of the cell and saying, I'm not insulin because you, you know, I'm not, I'm not opening the door anymore. That blood sugar is going to stay in the blood. I mean, your blood sugar is staying there. It's not coming into the muscle because you've been knocking on the door too much, right? And exercise helps to make you more sensitive. I think we have another question right here. Good morning. Uh, I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist who works with diabetes as oh, well so you can help him. <laughs> as kidney disease, um, weight management, appreciate that as we get older we need more protein. But I'm also, um, when I work with folks, I individualize the protein sure. and I'm concerned about overdoing the protein, especially with kidney disease. It's a silent disease. Most people don't know. Half well, of the people I, that go on dialysis right. don't know they have kidney disease until mm -hmm. they end up in the ER or in a right. crisis situation. So I'm for individualizing so, the protein. Well, a absolutely. I will say that um, when we're looking at a public sort of issue, sarcopenia affects way more people than kidney disease. The recommendation is 0.4, I'm gonna let you win it, 0.4 grams of, of protein per kilogram of body weight um, for the majority of people as we age. And I can show you, I'm happy to share with you all the references. Um, I am more than happy. I will tell you that working with AARP for this book, I couldn't say that cardiovascular, that um, cardiovascular exercise was good for your heart and lungs. They would say, show me a reference. So every single thing that we are talking about is well researched and well referenced, and there's a plethora of studies around what we're recommending. I'm not just making it up. Of course, if somebody has a disease state, they should personalize it and work with their healthcare provider and reach out to a registered dietitian, for sure. But I do think that the major most of our health issues around weight gain as we age and the resultant um, health issues that we find from lack of muscle is way more prevalent. And I also just want to reiterate what Heidi said earlier, which is that this is not a high protein diet. It's not, right. That's different from some Americans people. should not eat any more protein than they're eating right now. They should well, just simply should. stop eating as much at dinner and eat more at breakfast. So it's that giant dose of protein that we're getting at dinner that is really, you know, part of the problem when it comes to kidney disease. 
Hi, I'm Stephen and Heidi. I'm sorry, this has been great. We have time for one more question. Right Hang on. This nice lady had her oh, hand okay. up. But I want to say, after and an yeah, or, or wherever your tables oh, are, table absolutely. Right down here. Yeah, so we're going to take one more. Thanks. Okay. So are you saying that it's much better to have three meals with 30 grams or more of protein than, say, six with 15 or more? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, it is true if you're smaller or larger, like I work with football players, right? And okay, they're not... I might take the amount of protein they need for that very large body, divide it up, and figure out they might need six meals of 20 to 25 grams, but 15 grams doesn't push that muscle building button, unless you're much smaller. Like again, I'm looking at the average number of people. If you're much smaller, you might need more like 17 or 18, maybe 15, I doubt. 15 might be a little low, but between 15 and 20. Um, that might be adequate if you're a smaller person. Um, and, you know, aging, I mean, how active you are may have an impact. But, yes, too low protein, you do, you do, not, you do not hit the threshold of overcoming anabolic resistance. Right. Imagine it's like a button. You gotta, as we get older, we got to press the button harder in order to make those muscles jump and go, yes, all right, I'm going to start rebuilding now. And this is slow and steady. Like, this isn't, like, immediate, you know, this isn't a quick fix, we're looking at over time, right? We're looking at, we, we, we lose gradually over time and we're gonna maintain or build over time. Yeah. Thank you All so right. very much. We really All appreciate it. All right, well thank you so attention. much. And we if really you have questions, come visit us down at 57.